Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Today we're going to party like it's 1814. Ten score and four years ago, a battle by land and by sea engulfed our region. The Battle of Plattsburgh could be heard from the Canadian border to as far south as Mount Philo. It involved militias from New York and Vermont and featured one of the biggest British ships ever to sail Lake Champlain and starred a dashing American naval officer who proved to be as lucky as he was skillful and, let's not forget, the rooster. More on that in a moment. Joining me is Don Wickman, director of the Kent Delord House Museum in Plattsburgh. Welcome to you. Yes, welcome, Judy. It's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah, now, Don, for those who are not history buffs, talk about the significance of this battle. Okay, we set the stage a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, 1812, the war breaks out, and 1812 and 1813 are not going well for the Americans. Uh, they're well, defeats are outnumbering victories. Mm -hmm. But in 1814, the British decide to um, attack on the Niagara frontier and they're going to make a, an invasion toward Plattsburgh because they want to control Lake Champlain. At this time, the American armed forces are in better condition. And when they decide at the Battle of Plattsburgh, the land battle turns against them, but what's more significant is that they lose the battle on the waters and because of that they can't control the lake they can't control the valley and their army which far outnumbers the americans has no choice but to go back and retreat and this is so significant it actually triggers the british to come to the peace trade uh peace table mm -hmm. what about the rooster okay the <laughs> rooster um on board commodore thomas mcdonough's ship is a rooster it's caged and that's the Saratoga. Well, during the part of the battle, um, a British cannonball breaks open the cage and the rooster flies up in the rat lines of the Saratoga, flaps its wings and crows like the devil. And because of it, it actually is looked upon as a good omen and excites the um, American crewmen that are aboard the vessel. So um, there's actually a contest this year of um, a rooster calling contest <laughs> on Saturday afternoon uh, for who might be able to crow the best. Awesome. Yes. Well, let's not forget that lives were lost during this battle. And so there are lots of commemorative events t to right. honor that. Yes, and they, had, uh, they start on September 6th. That's where there's almost a parade of them. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one at Culver Hill, which was an opening engagement on September 6th. And that same day, then at Halsey's Corner, and those are in Beekman Town and the town of Plattsburgh. The most solemn one, and I have to say I'm coordinating it right now, is at River Street Cemetery in Plattsburgh, where after the battle, the Americans took the British officer dead and the American dead and uh, buried them in the same section of the uh, cemetery, which was a wonderful gesture on their part of recognizing the loss of the battle. And then they have smaller ceremonies at the Old Post Cemetery on the military base and Crab Island where the American hospitals were. Amazing, so what other activities have you got planned? Oh, there's loads of stuff yeah. going on. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, they choose the word commemoration because they wanna wake up to the fact that it's important out there, that, that men lost their lives um, for what they believed in. Uh, but it's part celebration also. Uh, there's a whole schedule from, uh, from starting Thursday night all the way to Saturday. Um, Talk a little bit about um, some of the, the bands that are playing. There's going to be a lot of music. Okay, loads of music. Um, and part, it starts with on, sa on Thursday night, a mm -hmm. very popular uh, folk and country band uh, called Bear Tracks is playing at the Strand Theater. And I'm just going to mention the headliners here. Sure. Uh, and then on Friday night, there's a, a very popular band that hasn't played locally too much. It's out of Saranac Lake, New York, called the Blind Owl Band. Mm -hmm. uh, they... Um, Somebody described it as being extremely uh, um, eclectic, uh, sort of electric folk. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And on Saturday evening, the Glengarry, uh, Glengarry boys, uh, they're out of the St. Lawrence River Valley, and sort of, they play Celtic and Electric Celtic. Very popular folk. But during the same time at a popular tavern called Olive Ridley, which is pretty close to Trinity Park, where the other two bands that I just mentioned are playing, uh, they're bringing back what they call the Israel Green Tavern. Now, the Israel Green Tavern actually stood in Plattsburgh in 1814 and was a scene for a very big celebration after the battle. And that's going to be a venue that will serve some uh, 19th century foods. And also, sir, uh, from Friday and Saturday, uh, be a venue for primarily folk and local music. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty you to do if you're into the music. And also, there are lots of bands coming. There's going to be a parade. Yeah, parade. People love parade. <laughs> Especially Plattsburgh loves to hold parades. And at 1 o'clock, there's going to be a parade that will uh, start up on the Elks Club on Cumberland Avenue and go all the way to City Hall. It's featuring bands uh, local and um, out of state. One of the most popular ones is the Royal Marine Band out of Coburg, Ontario, numbering over 65 in number. And they later do a big concert at the Strand on Saturday night. Um, and there's about 50 uh, different organizations or um, that are going to be participating. Mm -hmm. And it's wonderful to watch it go by. It draws people like crazy. And then they all, uh, the reviewing stand is at City Hall, and then they gather together and do what they call a um, beat retreat. What's that? Okay. They get all the bands together on City Hall Place, and they start off by um, with one pipe playing and then go into uh, playing Amazing Grace. And you're, you might be dealing with over 150 musicians that are doing that and it's a great attraction, attraction and very poignant. I've only seen one because of my involvement with the Kent DeLord House. Let's talk a little bit about the Kent DeLord House because there are things that are going to be happening there as well. Yes, we've sort of, uh, we've always had since 1997 a grand encampment and this year we decided to rebrand it, reprogram it and call it a military muster. So we're still going to have the reenactors, probably a hundred reenactors. There's going to be bateaus uh, which are large watercraft that there is a bateau race on the Saranac, uh, well, on Plattsburgh Bay. Mm -hmm. And it always is a challenge because there's a sandbar at the mouth of the Saranac River, which can disrupt things a little bit. Uh, but we are featuring more family activities. Um, as you can see by the image, there's calligraphy, candle making, uh, there's uh, cartridge making, there's going to be a demonstration and a hands-on that you can do laundry, uh, colonial style or mm -hmm. 19th century style. So that's going to be something that we're really going to be trying to draw people in. There's going to be demonstrations of gunsmithing, uh, wood carving, um, basket weaving. And one of the best parts is it's a camp. And the reenactors, they really love to talk. If you ask them, if you get over the shyness, they love to tell you what they're doing, how long they've been in. Uh, some of them have been at it for 25, 30 years, and they just love to share that knowledge. We're gonna have two interpretive tables. They're laden with American and British uh, reenactment material, so people can actually ask, what's this, what's this, and get good authoritative answers. Well, it's very interesting because camp life was a big part of the military life. And what's really is, we always have the military aspect, but most of the time was camp, uh, spent in camp. Mm -hmm. And to them, it was probably very boring. Uh, but for the vid visitors, they're, they're always intrigued that these um, families, and it's men, women, and kids, always want to go back to um, 1814. And reenact what was going on. Yes. And we should mention, too, that these, there are hundreds of people that come for these reenactments as far as to participate. And it's really important to them to get everything as authentic as possible, even right down to buttons on their clothing. Correct. Correct. And um, having been a reenactor during the 1970s and 80s, I'm aware of that, is that there's so much specific um, data out there now so you can have the proper uniform um, and you hide things like watches. You don't wear uh, 21st century glasses. You have um, different spectacles that would be on. You do the same drill 
as anybody else. Uh, the one thing uh, a little different is after 48 hours of that, you can go back home. <laughs> <laughs> right, take a nice hot shower. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> now, you also have um, events for people who like noise. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Those reenactors like to shoot also. Right. And um, most people will say it's going to be battles. Uh, and really the term that has been adopted over the years is tactical weapon demonstrations. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be three on land, two on Saturday. One's going to be on the old base at 10 a.m. on Saturday. And then they're doing one at 8 p.m. where it's getting dark now, and so you'll actually be able to see flames coming out of the barrel. That's going to be down at the McDonough Monument, and it's um, actually historical where a party of Americans raided a British battery and captured it across the Saranac River. Sunday, they're going to be doing a street battle right in front of the museum on Cumberland Avenue. And right prior to that, they're going to have a um, small scale simulation of the American, uh, of the Battle of Plattsburgh Bay. There's no big vessels there, but the bateaus will be able to simulate what was going on and there's going to be narration. And that's a pretty popular event. It's very popular. And of course, you're sitting at the Champlain Monument, so you have the perfect outdoor venue. You're up on a bluff, and you're being able to see everything down on the water. Mm -hmm. And so how many people usually attend? Um, I have no idea, but I would say thousands. Yeah. Well, through the house, we've had 700 people come through the house. We actually count numbers for that mm -hmm. because attached to the encampment on the ground and all the activities, uh, the house is open to self-guided tours, and there's people in the rooms to help answer their questions. And it must be remembered that the British officers were quartered there for five days in 1814. So it's a, it's a definite link. It gets reenactors excited because you don't have a lot of opportunities to be on actual ground. Talk a little bit about that, because that's an interesting aspect from a reenactor's standpoint, is to be actually on the same turf where right. these things happen. Right. And it's close to like a bonding experience um, there. And having witnessed it myself, there's something more special when you're actually there. Uh, and you can say, wow, people were here. The British were here. And we also know that before the British were there, American officers were in the house also. Uh, there's artifacts. We have cannonballs on display that were found on the grounds during that time. And most likely they're American ones because the British had batteries on either side of the museum. So there's that wonderful link. I call it a link with the past. Some people think a spiritual link with the past. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know of any casualties, but you still have the spirits in general mm -hmm. um, of the soldiers. What kind of questions do people ask you when they come through the house? Uh, sometimes they ask on the spiritual. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think they're more surprised about the fact that it's actually a time capsule, that until William Miner started um, from Shazy, a wealthy entrepreneur, started um, providing money toward the upkeep of the house, it had no running water, plum modern plumbing, electricity, or heat. And that was in 1913. Mm -hmm. And that was later converted. And also probably close to 90% of the furniture and artifacts on display are actually related to the Delord uh, three uh, generations. So very authentic. Very. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a mix of 18th through 19th century materials. So where can people get uh, information and a schedule on what's happening? Okay. Best thing is hop on the internet mm -hmm. um, and go to the two, um, we're probably going to post the two here mm -hmm. uh, the two Facebook uh, the two websites one is the city of Plattsburgh uh, the other one is the Kent Delord house and uh, both of those will be posted the one for the Kent Delord house is going to be Kent Delord house specific uh, the one for the city is going to give you the full range of events from Thursday through Sunday we're sneaking in more of the things we're going to have artillery demonstrations going on some simulated duels other things uh, one uh, Two items I'd like to mention that are sure. really special for Sunday is at 10 a.m. there's going to be a 19th century church service um, at the gazebo at Champlain Monument with, and I've been laying out part of that with 19, well, with period hymns. Mm -hmm. And also the Plattsburgh Shape Note Singers are going to be doing one uh, hymn and later on do a demonstration of Shape Note Singing, which is music without music. 
or without any instruments. Mm -hmm. And people are welcome to bring their voices along at the same time. Well, Don, I want to thank you for joining us today and talking about this big weekend coming up. It's always a pleasure, Judy. Many, many thanks. Sure. Yeah. That's our program for today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. I'll see you again next time on Across the Fence.